My fingers are bored. They need something to do. What's that? I can tickle you. Yeah. Tickle, 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 tickle. I'm wondering how long I can play this until you have to submit and beg me to stop. Wow, my friend, that was lots of fun. But now it's time to tickle somebody else. What's that? I can tickle you. Yeah. Tickle, 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 Everybody, welcome to Too Much CGI. We've shown you Wang Wang. We've shown you so many things, and today we're showing you Tickle, 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 Tickle. I don't know what this is. I found this song for the ending of the last episode, and it has not left my goddamn head all day. Since editing. Tickle, 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 tickle. And it's some weird ass YouTube video. I'd give it credit, but like I lost the YouTube video that fast. This was really a song made on YouTube and it's the best. Did you have to go digging for this song or is this something big and popular that kids are watching that I just don't even know about? No, I had to dig for it. So, you know, I like that, that <laughs> tickle, tickle, tickle sound effect so much. And I was like, I don't know how to end this. And I'm tired and Sunday night. And let me just go YouTube tickle. And that was already creepy because all these kid, you know, videos popped up. And I was like, let me pick the creepiest one. And it was this guy. <laughs> well, I think you hit the mark on that one, buddy. This is, If there's a weirder one out there, I couldn't imagine what the fuck it is. Because I heard this on playback in my car yesterday. And I was like. This is our show. Like, this is the ending of our show. What the yeah. hell just happened? Oh, I'm just trolling everybody. I mean, I just can imagine <laughs> everybody going, what in the fuck? What the? God? The Internet is a weird place, and it's our job to, to inform you. I mean, we have to do this. You found it. Welcome to Too Much CGI, everybody. This is the show where we talk about all kinds of pop culture geekery, both retro and today. If you were a kid in the 80s or even the 90s, this is your tribe, man. We Join us. But there is one catch. But there's one. Remember, Only I like that we came catch. up with it last week. Got to pay the price. Got to tell somebody. You got to tell somebody. You got to tell at least one person. Just tell one person about us. And then you can listen. We'll wait. Go. Also, if you don't mind, we would love a rating. Ratings actually help our show grow. It's hard to grow in this current climate full of a bazillion podcasts. So if you go to ratethispodcast.com slash too much CGI, it should take you right to a platform that allows you to rate us. And that really does help us. You know, the technology, it's all about algorithms, Scott. And we like to piss off the algorithms, it seems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, <laughs> you remember me telling you. So the YouTube video of the Kill Dozer, it, it will not allow us to have transcripts. It was too controversial for YouTube. I didn't even know this was that controversial of a topic. I thought I kept it pretty even keel. Yeah, I don't know what it was that you said that offended YouTube. I, I have to imagine it's just bots. People aren't actually watching these videos. So I think the bot just saw kill and was like, oh, it's in the title. It had to send up a red flag. I think that's probably why we got flagged for it. Dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Well, how's your day been? I'm tired as hell. I've been working nonstop. I got, it's one of these days for me where I go to San Diego tomorrow morning. So it's like, get oh. everything done and then find time to pack. Go fuck yourself, San Diego. And find time to podcast. So I haven't really been able to do a whole lot. It's been a lot of work this week. It's real busy here. At my All I can say is fuck daylight fuck savings you. time. Yeah. Hate it. Boo, Hate stink. it. What happened to it going away? There was legislation, and now it's down at the state level where certain states are working to outlaw it. It wasn't on my petition today. Today's voting day in Pennsylvania, and uh, I went out and rocked the vote this morning, but um, there was nothing on there about daylight savings time. Just a lot of shit about school boards and judges. I hate this time of year because, um, you know, I've talked about depression. I have a little bit of it, you know, so it's like this, the, the seasonal depression thing is real. And they sure. actually create these mood lights or uh, we call it the happy light. And it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's just a light that I turn on in the morning to emulate sunshine, you know, getting good old vitamin D from the sun. So it's supposed to emulate like a that. blast of like UV lights. Yeah. How big is your UV light? No more than like a uh, handheld mirror, you know, that you would look, oh, you would okay. try to do makeup in. Yeah. It's not very big, but it's super bright. And it's like, if you look yeah. at it, it's like staring at the sun. 
And when <laughs> my wife recommended it to me, uh, she's like, you got to try this. People say it works. I'm like, this is ridiculous. There's no way it works. But I like it. Yeah, I actually think it does work. Very strange. So is the brain. Human body's a weird thing, man. Yeah, it's like the worst time of year for it, too. Like, now I'm waking up and it's dark and I'm coming home from work and it's dark. Walking the dog in the dark. Everything is just fucking dark, dark, dark. And now we have kids sports starting. We have kids dance going on. So it's like we have to run all over the place. It's just no rest for the weary, man. I remember being a little kid when this would happen. There was like certain days of the year where it'd be just absolutely pitch black when I'm out standing by the bus stop. Like, where's this bus? <laughs> It's pitch freaking black. And I'll tell you something else. Kids, like especially babies, infants, kids, animals, they don't know. My body doesn't know that we turn the clocks back. Like, I usually get done work at 5.30, and now I'm sitting at my desk at 4.30, and my body is like, it doesn't want to be there anymore. It knows that I shouldn't be in this building anymore. Run away is what my body's telling me at 5.30, at 4.30. Which, yeah, let's face it, time is a man-made construct. And the fact that we just fuck around with it just overemphasizes that point. So, yeah, we can turn the clock back. And the time may say 4.30 on that clock. My body knows it's time to go. I like that you said animals, too. Yeah, my dogs are, they are complete creatures of habit. Because when it's 7 o'clock, they're up and they're waking us up. Well, now it's 6 o'clock and they're up hey. waking us up. I'm okay. I get up pretty early, but my wife is still asleep. It's not her time to wake up yet. She still has two more hours. I, I've had to wake her up at seven. I had to say, it's time. Get up. These dogs need some attention. <laughs> I just spent an hour with them. Yeah. And they were absolutely programmed by just their internal clock. They know that it's dinner time when it's technically not dinner time because they remember the feeling of five o'clock. That's crazy. Yeah. Hardwired, man. Hardwired. Well, switching gears, completely random segue here. Have you watched the new trailer for that Echo Marvel show? I have. Um, what did you think? Man, that is a crazy <laughs> idea. They're going to go ultra violent now. They're going to try Marvel like the Netflix Marvel was. Yeah, but did you see what they did? This doesn't connect to anything else. This is now that Marvel Studios thing, not Marvel Cinematic Universe thing. So this is going to be like Werewolf by Night, where it doesn't connect to everything else which is crazy because I didn't realize we already saw Echo. Echo was that woman, the hearing impaired woman from Hawkeye. Yeah. Yeah, I this is a spinoff from Hawkeye. Well, with this Marvel Studios banner, they're saying like this shouldn't connect to anything. And I'll say one thing, Vincent D'Onofrio looked fucking incredible in this trailer. I just couldn't believe, you know, this is a kid's studio and they've never gotten really hardcore with anything. I mean, I, I, Doctor Strange was gory but in a silly way but this is just like damn they are shooting people blood squirting out of people's necks like what the hell and i'm thinking <laughs> when i saw it like they must know that echo was a bad decision and they're like what do we do what do we do we, we have this thing on the, the board now we better find a way to make this interesting what if we go hardcore violent all right we haven't done that yet you know we've already put out a kid's version we put out the miss marvel we're trying to meet the horror fans with werewolf by night and doctor strange we haven't done ultraviolet Let's try ultraviolet. That's what I think this might be. Maybe, but what if they're just paving the way for Deadpool? I'm Daredevil. And then I thought that. So the current Deadpool that was slated to come I'm back, Daredevil. they've canceled that. They canceled that with the writer's strike. And I think because he was kind of silly in She-Hulk, where he was reintroduced into the MCU. Right. I right. think they went, you know what? Now nah, we're going to reboot him again. Keep it bloody. And keep him yeah. bloody. I think people want him bloody. That's what I bet they're thinking. And I bet you, through this series, we're going to eventually see Deadpool. I'm Daredevil. Not Deadpool, Daredevil. Deadpool, hey, he's even, they're talking about him all the time now because his movie coming up apparently has a ton to do with this multiverse and how this whole multiverse thing ends. So they're really apparently, according to rumors, weaving him into how this whole multiverse thing ends for Marvel. Wait, I was talking about Deadpool through the Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. Were right. you talking about Daredevil? I was talking about both. I switched gears. Oh, okay. You threw me like, off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to throw you. Hey, I've had a lot of coffee today. <laughs> <laughs> so Segway Master is going to be all over the goddamn place, huh? Yeah, all over. <laughs> Left, right, up, and down, straight into a wall. Aside from the violent aspect of it, what did you think about the, the trailer? Girl is uh, kind of orphaned. 
uh, kind of picked on big man Fisk. Yeah, yeah, he comes and oversees her, and that's kind of it. Kind of all they really say. So I don't know. That doesn't look like anything to me. We'll see. Yeah. See, but I like the bozos of Hawkeye with like the tracksuit mafia and like that that throwaway enemies. It almost reminded me of the Foot Clan from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We could just beat the shit out of them. Yeah. Or stormtroopers in in Star Wars. You know, it was like those expendable heroes. But there were those few guys that were like memorable and kind of like comic relief. The Russian guys. The Russian guys. Yeah. Hey, come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> But I got to tell you, as much as we've been shitting on the MCU lately, Loki is fascinating. Loki is absolutely fascinating. So, yeah, like this Thursday is the last episode, episode six. I haven't watched episode five yet. But episode four was just like, what? Like, okay, well, now she hit the fan. Five is cool and six we're going to see. And I really think that this is them tying into what's ultimately going to become the next Avengers movies. Like this is really the main pathway in based on the okay. kind of content. That's what I'm thinking. And I watch that screen crush too. And Ryan Aries also like, I, you know, we plugged that show before it's an amazing show because he fills in all the blanks. He's like, this is what they're doing. And then they're leading to this. And then you go, Oh, that's brilliant. Wow. That's amazing yeah. writing. I would have never seen this. I don't know how you noticed that Ryan. It, it's completely invisible to me. Cause this show was made like shit. <laughs> Not that Loki is, but the other ones are. I feel like a lot of this is kind of written in the comic books. Like Secret Wars is going to bring everybody back. That's how this goes. You don't think that they deviated so much from the main content that they we're pretty deviate, much on? But they still have these tentpole movies, and this is just a bridge to that. All right. No offense to Ryan. I mean, I think Ryan does a great show, but I don't think he's like looking into a crystal ball here. I mean, I feel like Kevin Feige is kind of He's off the rails at some point, but he's still on the train. Yeah, the reports about him have really been that he's always been the guy. <laughs> what is the one quote? This is the guy that knows how to land a plane in foam. Yeah. And like, that's his model. You know, like, let's ram this into the ground and I'll save it. And it's been working great until he's had too many movies to do it once. And then he can't save all the planes. And that's why some of these planes have been landing so bad. That's why some of these shows are really tanky. So that could yeah. be true. Could be true. Very possible. Do you see they put out that werewolf by night in color? Yeah, but I, I didn't watch it because I kind of liked the black and white aspect. It gave it that film noir type feel. Yeah, I was like, oh, skip this. I don't care. Yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> and weren't there aspects of the black and white that were like in red? And like, I think like the flower on his lapel was in yellow. Like they use color to emphasize certain important things in the story. So I thought that that was a nice cinematic touch. Well, you're going to have to watch it to see how they deal with it, because I'm not going to watch it. You're going to have to take the bullet. I'm not watching it. I liked it the first time, but not enough to watch it again. I'd rather keep on watching my scammers getting busted on YouTube. I'm still addicted <laughs> to watching scammers get busted. There's so many channels now where they just bust scammers. What's this, catfishing? Uh, social catfishing? Social catfish, I still watch that, but there's other ones. There's other ones where it's just people who get into scams and there's this one guy who's like figured out how to hack into their computer while they hack him and he's like taking and pulling pictures out and uh he starts talking to the person who's scamming him and this guy's doing a uh, really bad old lady impression and he's like oh sonny where is uh why all of a sudden am i seeing on my screen that you have two train tickets to lagos nigeria and then you hear the guy like go oh, well, i don't know what you're talking about ma'am and he's like trying to get out of it and pretend he's really <laughs> working at amazon you know what I mean? So, <laughs> and then sometimes they rage and go, oh, I know what you're doing. You're a scammer. You're trying to scam me. And then the scammers start yelling at each other. It's so much fun. It's like prank calling the scammers. But it's a lot more about showing up the scammers and teaching you how they are doing it. And they are so damn clever. I can see why people fall for these scams. They are tricky. Let me tell you about the rabbit hole I've gone down here. Um, but down this road a little bit here over the past summer but especially in the past week there's a channel on youtube called bright sun films they cover a lot of different things usually like the history of like the collapse of big businesses or things like that but what i'm really into them on their channel is these abandoned films where they just go into like abandoned places that were like old hotels or resorts or shopping malls or you name it, uh, old circuit cities, and you can still see like the crazy shit people leave behind. Like these businesses, I get they go out of business. A lot of them got hit by the pandemic, but like this one hotel they went into, 
they left behind like everything in the kitchen. Like I would have to think if that company liquidated everything, they could have gotten some significant money back just from the stuff that they already had purchased that they left to sit there and rot. And the other thing that blows my mind is just how quickly nature can really just come in and reclaim land. Like trees just start growing up out of the middle. The one mall that they went into, like the creepiest thing, like there's always that eeriness of like, they're going to run into somebody or there's like a squatter. or There's always like that on edge feeling that I have, like they're in there and they're not supposed to be kind of thing. But like they were in this one mall and it looked like every mall from the nineties and like the center court, like plant things, they're just like overgrowing. And it looks like something from the last of us. And it's just really fucking. Wow. 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 So yeah, man, I don't know why it's so fascinating to me, but I really do think it's like all that, like, Oh, I'm kind of vicariously trespassing someplace. I'm not supposed to be. Is he going to get caught? Uh, they did one. It was a, a one of the very first car manufacturing factories in Michigan. And like these places are just sprawling. And you can't imagine like there's just this real estate just sitting there. Like the land itself has to be worth millions. I mean, the economic crash of 2012 and the pandemic took a lot of places out of out of business. And it seems the bigger they are, the harder they fell. Well, you know, I do photography. Every photographer I know is looking for those abandoned places. Uh, there's a whole style called Urbex, which is basically go and take pictures of those old abandoned places. And, well, I found one that was uh, in PA, but it's an abandoned pump house, canal pump house, like a giant, oh. massive, huge gear and machine that you have to walk around. And the hole is so deep and there's a really bad spiral stairwell to get down to the bottom. And you walk around this thing and you're just like, how does this exist here? There is a person who oversees it. I guess he owns the land and he lets his photographers in once in a while. So it's a secret place, but it's like without him, nobody would ever be able to kind of get into this place. But to think that there's places like that, just abandoned, just sitting there unused, they're all over the place, but they're hard to find and they're hard to get into. This was a different guy. This wasn't bright sun. So it's a little off topic, but there's a guy called It's History, uh, Ryan Sokash. He's on YouTube as well. He did uh, some abandoned places. He did the Pennsylvania Turnpike Abandoned Tunnels. I've heard like of that would one. drive out. Yes. Yeah, there's like two abandoned tunnels that went right through the mountain on the like between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh on the turnpike. And yeah, there's just these tunnels that sit there. I've seen them. Unused. I've seen them. Somebody's even told me that there's a vent above that if you go up and crawl in, there's like the secret paradise. of. I'm like, I'm not doing any of that. I'm too old to be crawling into some crawl space in an abandoned tunnel in the middle of Pennsylvania. No, no. but some people love doing that kind of stuff. I've went to a abandoned um, amusement park in Connecticut. I was just going to say abandoned. Amusement. They do a lot of those as well. And they are weird. This one was a park that was across a bridge, but the damn bridge kept burning down. So the business basically went under because the amusement park who has to keep fixing a bridge eventually gets tired <laughs> of fixing the bridge and just says, fuck this business and walks away. And everything was just rotten there. The, the big auditorium was just rotten away. And there's all the chairs rotting away. And there's the Ferris wheel rotting. Away. I don't think they had a Ferris wheel, but they had a merry-go-round. And there's dolls, and, and it's like you said. It's like there's a lot of stuff they could have taken and sold. I remember seeing random tricycles around. Like, it just didn't make sense. Yeah. But it felt like what you would think a abandoned, you know, town where some monsters came and took everybody would look like. <laughs> it looked like that, even though it was an amusement park. Yeah, yeah. They do a lot of abandoned cruise ships as well, or like a, abandoned ocean liners, and it's just, like, real creepy. Wow, I'd like to see that. Check them out, man. Right sound films. When they showed the uh, videos of the Titanic after that that sub blew up, they started to show like other videos of people going down there, and I you can watch it on YouTube. James Cameron was one of them. It is spooky when you come up into that ship and you see it underwater. It's freaking scary, and I don't know why it's so scary. I don't know, man, but I think just places absent of life is just a really weird foreign phenomena a really weird feeling you know it's like when you go to see a bad movie and it's nobody there but you <laughs> you know you know you've made some bad decisions that's right you start to question what am i doing here i thought everyone would love ishtar right? it's empty
All right, we got a couple things to talk about. We got a lot to talk about, Scott. Holy moly, I don't think we're going to be able to get this all in. We're going to try. I got a what the fuck of the week. Oh. I have dead celeb of the week. Hmm. I don't know who that is. And I have mailbag. Let's do mailbag. And then dead. Let's, let's end on dead celeb. We'll end on a downer. That's what we seem to do. That's our brand. <laughs> That's our brand. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like you got one. I got one. So brother Steve and I were having a conversation back and forth. And I was laughing so hard at this. I want to read this to you. This is what friends do when they're bored and they're geeks. All right. I asked Steve if I could read this. So. He, okay, good. Yeah. He said no, but I'm doing it anyway. So it started out like this. There is a made-for-TV movie from the 70s called Kill Dozer. I said, based on this, meaning, you know, the episode we just did. Because I think this happened in the 80s, Scott said. Yep. Steve said it was way before the guy in Colorado. I guess that name just stuck in some reporter's head when writing about the shit barrel guy. <laughs> I didn't remember that news story, at least being called the Kill Dozer, but I feel like I heard of the term Kill Dozer before. But then we just kept going. And he said, did you see they're remaking The Fall Guy now? Yes. Yeah, I saw that commercial. Damn it. I love the fall guy. I forgot how much I like the fall guy. And now they're going to make that into a TV show. What did you think yeah, of that? With the fucking guy that plays Ken. Ugh. And then he says, we have to start a row in 80s remake before there's nothing left. Small wonder, Simon and Simon. I said, oh, that's, that's a great topic. And he goes, have any of these worked? And he's right. Like they keep on making these TV shows. None of these took off. They've never taken off. They watch hasn't taken off. None of these take off and they still try which is the craziest thing. But the fall guy, this is like a full length action movie, right? That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. I'll call it a show. So I'll give it a little bit of a break. I mean, it's based off of a show. So no, it, it was a show. You're right. You're right. It was a show. So then this is where it gets even more fun. He says, there's another movie project for you. Get the rights to every remaining 80s show and write them all into some kind of Avengers expendable giant cast movie. Then Hollywood would have to give up or pay you the rights. I said extortion. <laughs> it's fun. Imagine the scene where Small Wonder battles Mr. Belvedere for the peaceful release of Alf. <laughs> he says, and the big reveal that Bounty was secretly evil the whole time. Oh. Mr. Drummond and Punky Brewster's dad fought for custody of Webster in Night Court. I said, <laughs> that got me going. That was good. So I wrote back, people didn't know about Mr. Drummond's dark side. He was a drug lord and adopted children originally to make him look like a good man. But Charles in charge saw through the ruse and sent Kit. Airwolf, Auto Man, Manimal, and the Misfits of Science to take down the defenses outside the different strokes house. By the time Mr. Drummond called for his silver spoon pals, it was too late. Drummond had to run into his bunker and follow the secret tunnel to an undisclosed hideout at WKRP in Cincinnati. Wow. Steve said, I think this movie can save the world. I'm with him. I'm with him. We're going to do this. How dorky was that? That was a big nerd rant for sure. How, like, what was the time frame of this back and forth? <laughs> You know what? I don't want to tell you because that's really embarrassing. <laughs> I'm guessing it's like a good 45 minutes. I, it just felt fun to be a kid again and just do that stupid <laughs> shit. When you were young, like, did you do dorky things like this? I used to make our, my own radio shows. Steve would record something on a tape. He'd send it to me. Our buddy Matt was involved. We used to do all sorts of dorky shit like this. Um, aren't we making our own radio show right now, Bill? Holy shit. <laughs> That was a light bulb moment for me. I you. didn't make the connection that I never grew up. <laughs> I'm still doing this dumb thing. But did you like do that? Did you were you a geek like um, that? I think the extent of it for me was really just like combining all the toys in the toy box. And like Ninja Turtles could fight G.I. Joe, and then they could team up with fucking inhumanoids and, and centurions, and like they could all just fight the Lego guys. Like I always did shit like that. I also always tried to build like um robots out of like the constructs blocks that i had i was trying to build like working robots out of that the other big play thing i recall was like always trying to build a fort like an outdoor fort somewhere i lived in the city there were no tree houses but like i had this dream of like having like a big fort tree house like you saw in in tv shows that's cool yeah i was always into creating a story or creating jokes or writing like i always found the i remember being a little kid a real little kid in the 80s, listening to like Robin Williams stand up tapes and Bill Cosby tapes. And I think I always wanted to be a comedian. The problem is, I'm not funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I always like telling jokes and just trying to make people laugh and coming up with dopey stories for my G.I. Joe characters. Definitely a storyteller. 
The thing that stands out there to me, though, is really Bronson Pinchot and Balky being evil. He he does give me Tom Hiddleston type vibes. <laughs> always remember him from uh, the Langoliers, Stephen King's The Langoliers. He was always like a creepy, kind of evil guy since I've seen him in that to me. Oh, that's funny. Balky. Balky Bartakabus. From the island of Mepos. Wow, that's real good. <laughs> How did you remember that? Uh, the same way I remember that he lived with his cousin Larry Appleton in New York City. Incredible. What was the planet Alf was from? The planet Melmec. Wow, these weird words stay with you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to say. You're a savant. <laughs> well, let me share my mailbag here. All right. Keep this moving. I have a mailbag, more of a conversation than a mailbag, but... Brother Nick, the tribesman who we haven't heard from before. Um, I work with Nick. He brought the story of the Killdozer into my life. Very passionate about the Killdozer. Very much the leader of the fan club for Marvin Hemeyer. Very much views him as the champion of the downtrodden. Though Nick admits, this guy had some issues. <laughs> he wanted to point out that there was like a backstory that uh, maybe wasn't shared in the stories and the research I did. He says that the story he heard, Marvin never went to the sewage district to ask to have the sewage. In fact, he never shit on the property. He never used the bathroom on the property. The township was making him run sewage to the land, and he didn't want it. So the story that Nick tells, Marvin Hemeyer was never looking to have this land have plumbing run or sewage run. They were forcing it on him whether it be $70,000 or the cheaper septic tank version, he felt that they were extorting him. That's where the extortion came from. It was never a request on his behalf. Definitely changes the narrative. There's a different flavor there for yeah. sure. Um, you know, again, I, none of the research I did showed that, but I mean, as passionate as Nick is, I'm not going to question him. Um, the other thing, I, I heard this myself in playback. Remember how I said the shit barrel? <laughs> was a cement truck barrel. Mm -hmm. I read it as cement truck barrel. It was a cement truck barrel. Yeah, I know. It was one of those big cement trucks that like turns. <laughs> yes. Like that's what they were pumping shit yeah, into. That's what I, I envisioned. I didn't visually have that until I heard it during playback. <laughs> Even I got I was that like, one. Oh, a cement truck barrel. Uh, that makes a lot yeah. more sense. Okay. I like they must have just got a cement truck, dug a big hole, lift the cement truck barrel, and then somebody unscrewed it and it just dropped into the big hole. And they're like, there we go. Yeah. Placement. <laughs> Problem solved. And clearly he didn't shit on the property that much because that thing was in there from at least 1994 and it only hit the fan in 2004. Or I guess it was 2001. So just shy of 10 years. I shit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing when I listened to, uh, to the edit, I was like, he went after a graphics guy. Like, what did the graphics guy do? I love it. It's like a Kinko's guy. He's like, I'm going to run over Kinko's. And you're going down because you printed the things where people said bad shit about me. So I'm taking you out, too. <laughs> like, yeah, come he on. took out the newspaper. I'm thinking there's more of like a, a benign reason. Like, he made like a bad logo for his muffler business <laughs> or something. <laughs> like, I want to believe it was something <laughs> that stupid. <laughs> now you die, too. Oh, man. <laughs> burr, burr. <laughs> I mean, I was just getting crazy vibes of like that guy. The the <laughs> remember the jerk? There was just a random guy out in the field shooting, just a random shooter. Yeah. He hates these cans. He hates these cans, and he just points into the phone book. He's like, cans. "That's who I'm going after." I like this guy's That's like, "I'm right. going to hit the old Seven Eleven. I might knock down <laughs> the old Pathmark." You know, he's just making a list. I love it. I love this story so much. <laughs> because there's so much information that's still like the fill in the blank stuff is really the stuff we don't know. And that's the problem with yeah. all of this. Everybody seems to have information the other person doesn't have. So nobody yeah. can, you know, agree whether this guy was a villain or a hero. Maybe that's where the controversy comes in. Maybe YouTube's right. I don't know. But there is a lot of passion out there about him. So Nick wanted me to share that side of the story. Also, he said there was a side of the story as well about his wife, E. Meyer's wife. I guess she left him. So he was not doing well on many fronts of his life. So maybe your question about was this guy like Michael Douglas and falling down? He might have been. It sounds like he very well may have been. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an unfortunate ending to an insane story. 
Yeah. Like I was looking for pictures. I wanted to see aerial, you know, view of like this tank, <laughs> this kill dozer. Have you seen pictures of it? No, no, I wasn't able to find it. Oh. Have you seen it? I bought brother Nick a thermos for Christmas last year and I got him a kill dozer sticker to put on the side of his, of his thermos. So yeah, <laughs> I've seen it. Oh my God. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing the updated information. I still don't care who's right or wrong. It's just a great story. Yeah. I'm no judge. I'm no jury. I'm just a man. You want to know who died? You want to celeb death? So <laughs> I'm going to play a great clip from this dead celebrity. Okay. Need you to pay attention. Right. And tell me who this is. Let me answer that. You know, that is an absolute crock of You know, you and people in the news media, all of you uh, dwell on some negative piece of like that. And I don't know how Steve feels about it, but it just and you don't have to bleep one single word of this. <laughs> Didn't recognize I have it. No idea. No idea. I have no idea who that is. That, but they had to bleep a lot. He was wrong. That would be legendary Indiana basketball coach Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. Bobby Knight. I did see that he. Yeah, the classic chair throwing coach from Indiana dies at eighty three. And I didn't know much about yeah. him. I'm not a college, you know, basketball guy, but uh, <laughs> I knew about him. <laughs> you know, like I knew about his outburst. I knew about his legendary. outburst. I mean, yeah. Oh my god, they were funny. Throwing chairs, going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he made it to eighty three, just fueled on rage. Oh man, he had to mellow out though, right? Like that had to. Have, have, that's like a young man's game, being that rage and vengeful, right? It's got to be. I mean, I don't have the energy to be angry. <laughs> I'm trying to be angry. I'm trying to be angry, but I can't be. I'm trying. To. Can't do it. Don't have the energy. Not, not with daylight savings. All right. Well, I think that is everything on our agenda except our main topic. And you know what? At the head of the show, I forgot to announce what the main topic was. That's all right. We'll do it right now. Uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit of history here. And the topic is signal hijacking and broadcast pirates. Are you familiar with this? I'm praying after you say this, that we're going to talk about Captain Midnight. <laughs> the time, April 27th, 1986, at 1232 a.m., Captain Midnight interrupted HBO with a test pattern screen and the words protesting the monthly rates of the premium channel. No one knows who did it. <laughs> so a little bit of history here. Captain Midnight was clearly a pseudonym that someone used, right? So this occurs back in a time where things were regional, right? Like HBO here, clear, clearly it's a premium channel. HBO has always been premium. Something I learned while doing some research for this Back in the early days of HBO, they only scrambled their signal for 12 hours a day. So for the other 12 hours a day, if you had a satellite dish, like in your backyard or on your roof, and I'm talking about an 80 satellite dish, not like a direct TV bullshit that's like a foot and a half in diameter. These things were like five, seven feet. They stood in your backyard. Oh, yeah. They oh. they were massive. Do you ever see one every once in a while driving around? You see one of those old 80s, 70s satellite <laughs> dishes the size of a tennis court. Yeah, man, it's like you're doing part of the fucking like uh, space antenna project with NASA, it looks <laughs> yeah. like. But if you had one of these back in the day and you had the know-how and, and you knew how to aim it right and, and you knew where the satellites were, and there was almost it was almost like a ham radio community back in the day with satellite dish users. Um, if you pointed it at the satellite that carried HBO, the 12 hours a day that they weren't scrambling the signal, you got it for free. I mean, of course, you had to have the satellite dish, but after you had that initial cost, you could just pick up HBO for nothing. Well, all that changed in January of 1986 when HBO comes out with the message that, hey, satellite dish users, we know up to this point you've been able to watch us for 12 hours a day. We're making a change. We're going to scramble our signal for 24 hours a day. But if you pay us $12.95 a month and you buy this, three four hundred dollar the scrambler box you can continue using your satellite dish to watch hbo but now you're paying just as much as what the people that were getting cable 
cable was still very much in its infancy. Most people were still getting their television via antenna. I mean, if you lived in like a rural area, you were still using satellite dishes or antenna. You were not having cable run to your house. It was just not a service that was offered in many regions. So Captain Midnight here clearly took an issue with this. So during the airing, again, 12.32 a.m., they're airing a movie called The Falcon and the Snowman. Never heard of it. Two minutes into the movie, test pattern comes up. There's this message, and it says, Good evening, HBO, from Captain Midnight. $12.95 a month? No way. Showtime and movie channel, beware. (laughs) And it stayed up on the screen for about five minutes. And that's got to spook you. You're a person in the 80s. You, you really haven't seen a lot in life yet. And all of a sudden, somebody hacks your TV. I mean, that probably felt like to them, aliens were coming. Well, here's the thing. A lot of people didn't really know what was going on. But I'll tell you who it really did scare. The government. They're like DEFCON 1 because now they're concerned that civilians could just interrupt the satellite signals leading to concerns of technological spying and hijacking, and if, if civilians can do this, the Soviets can do this. Can they affect NORAD? Are we playing war games here? Like, what's going on? So the FCC freaks the fuck out, and they begin investigating. How could this have happened? They didn't get very far with their investigation, because 200 confessions came forward saying, I'm Captain Midnight. Really? 200 people stepped up. They wanted to take claim for this. The hacker community, this was very much in the infancy of of the world of hackers as we know them today. Because the FCC, uh, they needed some extra help. Next thing you know, the FBI gets involved. FBI realized that it's going to take a very powerful satellite dish to be able to overthrow, you know, the HBO signal. And what they find is they basically track it down to a uplink station in southern Florida. They track it down to a John R. McDougal who worked at the Uplink station part-time. His primary profession, he was the owner and operator and an engineer of a satellite dish company. Wow. Wow. Yeah. The perfect. Yeah. The perfect crime by the perfect perpetrator. Yeah. If anybody's going to take umbrage with this price hike, I mean, his business has taken a hit. Suddenly, the idea of owning a satellite dish is, well, What's the point? If I'm going to have to pay the same as the people getting cable, I might as well just wait it out, wait till cable comes around. Um, He admits to it. So he came forward. So it was tracked down that Captain Midnight was John R. McDougal. But to finish out John R. McDougal and Captain Midnight here, this is really the first time anything like this happened. After pleading guilty, do you know what the punishment was for Captain Midnight? A firm spanking. Basically. It was a $5,000 fine and a one year of unsupervised probation. And he also lost his amateur radio license for one year. What is unsupervised probation? He didn't have to check in. He didn't have to take piss tests. He didn't have to show that he was doing anything. He was just on probation for a year where, you know, mind your P's and Q's. If you get pulled over, you do more legal shit. Now we're going to come after you. And now you face jail time for the remainder of your probation. But it's not like he has to, like, check in with a probation officer every month. You know a lot about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. kind of. Not personally, but criminal. I know people. <laughs> so that was the fallout for Captain Midnight. The fallout for everybody else, following these events, broadcast hijacking became a felony offense. And they did that to defer any other copycats or hackers that were going to come out and try to you know, do this thing that was very enviable in the hacker world. So if you think about it, Captain Midnight sticking to the man just like Marvin Hemeyer. I like it. I wonder how they scramble. Now I'm kind of putting some things together that I've never really put together before. You know how you get your cable box and you're like, all right, we put a playing card into the cable box. We can de-scramble. <laughs> this. But I never understood what the scramble is. So I'll bet you it's now that you sort of described it the way you did. They send a signal, and it's probably the weakest little, like, encryption. It just kind of turns a few things around, and if you know how to decode it, because you work in the industry, you can decode it. So that's by somehow putting in the playing card, somehow decoded it. The 
the you cable stuff to give you stuff. some like real technical do you have here? it yeah i want to know how this works yeah, i do i do so hbo at the time of 1986 when this occurred it broadcast using a satellite called galaxy one John R. McDougal knew the coordinates for Galaxy One and, and the, the orbit that it went around. And HBO was broadcast from Galaxy One at a rate of 150 megahertz, I believe. That was a broadcasting wave. He sent his signal up there, pointing it right at Galaxy One with a amperage, or I don't know how they measure it, but he sent it up there at like 1,250. And for about 90 seconds during this five minute interruption, the HBO broadcaster, like the true person that's supposed to be broadcasting, tried to like overpower his and realize that like, holy shit, like we just t- set this up there like more than 10 times what this is supposed to happen. We could fry the entire satellite. <laughs> the HBO guy like yielded and basically John R. McDougal won that battle. And it only came off after five minutes because it says he felt guilty and felt bad. And he ended the broadcast. He put the satellite dish back in the the storage position and kind of went home hoping nobody saw anything. It wasn't until the next day when Tom Brokaw and every other news person across the country is talking about this hijacking of the HBO signal. And because it was still regional, the Galaxy One satellite was going to broadcast to the entire East Coast. At the time, HBO had about 14.5 million subscribers. This was about 7 million uh, of the 14.5. Not to say that all 7 million were tuned in at 1232 a.m. to watch the fucking Falcon and the Snowman, but it had the potential of seeing 7 million people seeing his message here of protest on a test pattern screen. So now it's a felony. That was the aftermath. It's a felony to, to fuck with the, the FCC and, and, and TV broadcasting. Right. The precedent is set. But a year later, on November 22nd, 1987, in Chicago, Illinois, somebody didn't get that message or they really didn't quite give a shit. At 9.15 p.m., signal for a local station was interrupted during a sports broadcast. The disruption lasted about 90 seconds. It was a video of a man wearing a mask of Max Headroom, the television character Max Headroom. No audio, just like the loud buzzing, but the sports broadcaster was there. It scrambled. There's Max Headroom. He's dancing around. Just so (laughs) erratic, so weird to see this video. Yes. And you can't hear anything that he's saying, but it lasted about 90 seconds. And then it went away, and it comes back, and the sports broadcaster's there like, Oh, I don't know what that was. Um, We're going to start over. So the Chicago Bears tonight, and he just goes right on with his business. All right. Forgotten. Weird, but forgotten. (laughs) For the moment. 11 o'clock that same night, a little under two hours afterwards, during a PBS broadcast of Doctor Who, here comes Max Headroom again. (laughs) Breaks right in. This one lasted about a minute and a half. And this one here, Max is there, still doing the same antics, but now he has audio. Mm -hmm. Bad audio, distorted audio. They think it was intentionally distorted. But you can look on YouTube, there's videos of this with subtitles. During the video, Max Headroom's singing, he's humming, he's promoting Pepsi, which is weird because at the time, Max Headroom was actually the spokesperson for new coke (laughs) so i don't know if he had the wrong pepsi if he had the wrong soda can or if he was like being ironic that he wasn't max headroom that he was promoting pepsi instead he was like the anti he's like catch the wave but catch the wave was the new coke slogan so nobody really knows what this was supposed to be at one point he puts on a glove similar to michael jackson and says oh my brother has the other glove this one's dirty starts flipping the bird to the camera and at the end of it the the 90 seconds wraps up with him having his bare ass out and a woman with a fly swatter is spanking him saying bend over bitch and he's yelling they're coming to get me they're coming to get me and when it wraps up nobody knows 
what the fuck they just saw. I don't even know what the fuck I just read. <laughs> I watched this prepping for this show no less than five times at about two o'clock this morning. And it was really weird. Yeah. Really weird. You've seen this? Yeah, I've learned about it uh, years and years ago on a show called Night Flights that used to air on NBC after Saturday Night Live. I don't even know if it was everywhere, but it was in Philly. And like it would just show this random lost stuff. And it showed me that. I was like, wow. So that's where I got the name Captain Midnight and always thought it was Captain Midnight. But yeah, Captain Midnight to me was that oversized head, which was that Max Headroom head. And the audio was like, uh, do you remember Carvel, Cookie Puss? Oh, Cookie Puss. Remember the Puss. voice? Yeah. Yeah, Cookie hey, Puss. everybody. Yeah, so it's staticky. It's this very robotic <laughs> Cookie Puss, and it's saying these weird things. And I remember everybody going, well, what do you think they really meant? I'm like, I, now I look at it and I go, I think it was some kid who wasn't funny trying to be funny. We're all wondering if there's more meaning to what he did. He just goofed yeah. off and somehow figured out how to hack. And had no real material or had no real purpose. He just grabbed props in his room. That's what it looks like now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is any kind of like avant-garde art installation or performance <laughs> piece. This is just probably a couple of college kids fucking around in South Chicago. Just dicking off, you know? That's <laughs> so funny. So immediately after this happened, investigations began to find out who did it. You know, hijacking the signal is illegally, reportedly punishable by one year in jail and up to $100,000 in fines now that it's a felony. There are no official recordings. And what recordings there are, like the ones that I found on YouTube, they really come from Doctor Who fans who just happened to be recording that episode <laughs> that night because nobody at the station was really paying any kind of serious attention to this. Yeah. So again, viewers loved it. The government was pissed. A reward was offered to anyone who could provide information to an arrest. No one was ever caught. So now here we are 30, 35 years later, is it? 37 years later, I guess it is. Yeah, no one knows who this was. There are full on subreddits devoted to the Max Headroom incident. You have people on there like saying like real names. One name kept popping up on there who says that they know who did it, but they won't divulge who did it until after the individual dies. I don't know if that's real. I really was going down some rabbit holes with this this morning. But then you have some people on there that are just like, oh, no, like this was actually the CIA. The CIA was, they actually wanted to hack it. It was an inside yeah. job. There's like those inside oh, job I people. It's it. like, they want to see like the effects of television and how they can put, you know, subliminal messages out there to control the people. Yeah. And people are like, what the fuck are you smoking? So there's like real whack jobs on this thing. There's people that are like really trying to solve it in earnest, I believe. But I don't know what to believe because it's so corrupted by like whack jobs out there. And I really don't think that there's been any new posts on this thing for about the past five, six months. I always thought when I hear these kind of like theories, nobody really believes it. You know, when I started first hearing about flat earthers, I'm like, obviously, nobody really <laughs> believes it. They're just being performers. Hmm. Well, Max Headroom was out there. This really happened. Yeah, there's nothing to it. It was just a hack. It was just a fun little incident. There's nothing deeper yeah. here. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it as well. And really, these last two incidents, they happened back during the age of analog, right? There was satellite signals and stuff. Since things went digital, it's gotten really quiet. But not silent, Bill. There have been some more recent events here. <laughs> I have two more here and an honorable mention. In 2007, the Disney Channel in the New Jersey area was interrupted by straight-up pornography. Only lasted a few minutes, but during an episode of Handy Manny? Yeah, I think Manny was getting a handy. Whoa! Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> I just cut right into it, man. Uh, nobody knows who did it that I know of. I don't think there were any arrests made for that one. Uh, but very similarly, two years later in 2009, during the Super Bowl, Bill, one of the biggest TV audiences you're ever going to get, viewers of the Super Bowl in the area of Tucson, Arizona, got themselves an eyeful of about 37 seconds of porno. <laughs> so all the art and all the fucking around just evolved into porno being put where it's not supposed to be. Wow. That's awesome. 
honorable mention, and I say this is honorable mention because it's really not breaking into broadcasts or anything. Remember, you don't hear it a whole lot anymore, and I think it's just because of how we're taking our entertainment nowadays, but remember growing up, there would always be those alerts from the emergency broadcast system. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then it became like the emergency alert system. It's like, this is a test. This is a mandatory test for the emergency alert system. Uh, you know, this station, uh, in coordination with local and federal laws, have to send out this test. Yeah, they were scary. They scared the hell out of me. I was like, I, I don't know what they're saying. They seem to be saying something scarier than what they're saying. Uh, I think I've only ever heard a few real ones, usually about like storms or inclement weather, things like that. Probably the, the thing we hear more of nowadays is like the Amber Alerts, where it just blows up everybody's yeah. cell phone. Well, in 2013, I think you'd be a lot more scared because in the areas of Minnesota, Michigan, lose Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, somebody broke into the emergency alert system and reported that the dead were rising from their graves <laughs> and attacking the living. Do not go near these bodies. They are considered extremely dangerous. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I don't think anyone ever got caught for that one. I don't know how you break it. That has to be an inside job. Well, today I'd like to reveal who that person was. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it was me. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> Man, that's brilliant. I would never have the guts to do anything like that. I was no. too afraid of getting caught. Absolutely. Man. Do you remember Howard Stern was doing a broadcast and they were somewhere public and some other radio company hated them and went and tried to cut off their, uh, their signal? Oh, yeah. Then he was like broadcasting on their feed. Which is like, that's a big violation of the FCC, but they were the ones doing it, so he had no control. Yeah, yeah. I think there was like, uh, he made content out of it, Stern, but I think there was a yeah. real lawsuit there. I think so, too. Um, I remember, and I don't know as much about this, but just speaking kind of of like radio pirates, similar to Stern, I remember Wolfman Jack. Like, Wolfman Jack was broadcasting as a DJ on multiple stations. And apparently he was like real grassroots, real guerrilla radio kind of not supposed to be doing it. So Wolfman Jack got his start kind of sticking it to the man and just getting his message out there and doing his own show. I don't know him except for weird cartoon appearances in the 80s. In The Simpsons? <laughs> no, like even earlier, like the Saturday morning, like he'd show up in the Happy Days cartoon or something. Like I didn't know what Wolfman Jack was. It took me a while until I finally said, oh, he's some kind of DJ that was popular at the time. Yeah, I had no idea who Wolfman Jack was, but he was in my uh, in my youth. Apparently, he was like on multiple stations before syndication was a thing, and that was like a big no no. I don't know the legalities of it, but apparently, he was like an early radio pioneer badass. So that's what I got as far as a uh, signal interruption, signal hijacking, and broadcast pirates. Good shit. <laughs> it's funny if nothing else. It ended a lot happier than the Killdozer. <laughs> yes it did all right we got to move the show along guys we got to do it we got to move it along but we still got to do the news so after the mario brothers movie comes out and it's a huge hit mario what do you think's going to happen next i would like to think legend of zelda they're going to go right to the well and start driving through their catalog of characters the legend of zelda is heading to the big screen really I was just guessing. After Universal's one billion hit adaptation, Super Mario Brothers, Nintendo is developing the new Zelda project with Sony Pictures Entertainment. Wes Ball, the director behind the Maze Runner trilogy, will helm the live action feature with Sony distributing. Nintendo and AV Rods, Arid Productions, or Rod Production, I don't know why he fucked that one up, but he's the guy who did the Spider Man, like the Sony Spider Man. Oh, okay, yeah. So he's going to be working on this as well. So there you go. Wait for that big Metroid movie, and then eventually we'll get the Kid Icarus movie, and then we're going to have our Nintendo mashup. Uh, then we have Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> yeah, the Super Smash Brothers movie. Or, God forbid, Mario Party. I couldn't see that being a good movie. I like that Super Smash Brothers. There was a game that I was just playing on uh, Xbox. It's like one of those free download games where it was Warner Brothers version of Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, I played that a little bit. Did you? Like, I mean, it's totally ripping off Smash Brothers. I don't know how the hell they didn't get sued. Yeah, you could be Batman. You could be Space Jam characters. You could be... There was a whole bunch of people yeah. you could be on that game. I was like, what the hell? It's a lawsuit coming. 
<laughs> All right. Here's this is another reason I had a bad day. Calling this item not a good time to be a creep. Danny Elfman. You know, I like Danny Elfman a lot. One of my idols. Yeah. Danny Elfman is contending against allegations of sexual abuse made by a woman known as Jane Doe, who claims that Elfman sexually abused her between 1997 and 2002. She alleges that Elfman, whom she met at 21 seeking a mentorship, frequently appeared nude around her and engaged in inappropriate conduct as part of his creative process. Oh, <laughs> that's some artist. These claims Damn. echo those of composer Nomi Abadi, who settled with Elfman in 2018 for 830000 an amount he reportedly hasn't fully paid. Elfman's representatives argued that the settlement was signed to protect his family during the Me Too movement. Elfman and his legal team, including lawyer Camille Vasquez, she's the lawyer that helped Johnny Depp, assert oh. that Jane Doe's lawsuit is baseless, malicious, and aimed at extortion and embarrassment. They maintain that no inappropriate physical contact or sexual assault occurred, challenging the validity and intent behind the lawsuit and the allegations within it. But there was smoke. Like, there was a prior... And that's what it sounds like. Charge. You know. but there was a prior settlement, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I didn't know anything about this. I had no idea. And, you know, it's like I was thinking about it, too. How many times do these accusations come true? More times than not. More times than not. But sometimes they're not true. But you just throw money at it to make it go away? Isn't that what they want? Yeah, I think that's what they did in the old days. And finally, the Me Too movie was we're not doing this anymore. So if you come out now, are you after money or are you after redemption? Right. Yeah, I guess it depends on the person. Or are you making it up and totally, you know, trying to be a bad guy? Yeah, I don't know. That's wild. Running around naked with his, you know, that's my, that's my creative process. See, in the 80s, that's the kind of dumb shit men said, you know? And it was like, yeah, isn't he crazy <laughs> for it? And it doesn't fly now. But this wasn't the 80s. This was 97 to 2007, wasn't it? Yes, it was recent. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come it on, man. It was a decade late. You got to wake up. Times change. Times change. I know you rock stars right. and celebrities and everybody are so insulated, but come on. Uh, allegedly. This is all allegedly. allegedly. Yeah, we're reading this from an article. Uh, yeah, well, come sue us. We got no money. We got nothing. We got nothing. Can't get blood from a stone. What is on the map? That's all we can get. Well, I got a Zack Snyder update. Oh. Zack Snyder's Netflix epic Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Similar to his previous film, oh, Army. This was the one that was going to be a Star Wars thing, and then it wasn't a Star Wars thing? Yep, yep, so it's finally coming out. Yeah. So previous to The Army of the Dead, which he made, uh, this movie will have a one-week theatrical release before its Netflix premiere. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let me skip some of the boring stuff. So it's playing in 70-millimeter theaters, which I think is kind of cool. You don't see that very often. Yeah. Because you know, that gives a certain feel to watching a, a big-screen movie. So it'll be all over Los Angeles, New York City, Toronto, and London from December 15th to December 21st, and then start streaming on December 22nd. I don't know. This I was, I'll was i keep reading this because I thought, are we really interested in this? The film stars Sophia Butella and a cast including Ed Skrine, Charlie Hunanem, and Anthony Hopkins. I can only name one of them, Anthony Hopkins. The rest I can't even pronounce. Initially, Snyder pitched the idea as a Star Wars story akin to the Seven Samurai with lightsabers. Isn't Star Wars already the Seven Samurai with lightsabers? <laughs> I kind of think so, yeah. Snyder, known for creating extended director's cuts, is working on a separate PG-13 and R-rated cut for Rebel Moon, with director's cuts including nearly an hour of extra footage. This approach is similar to his extended version of Batman vs. Superman and Justice League, which also received R ratings for more intense violence. So you're getting like, you're getting a massive director's cut version as well. Yeah. That's an interesting way to approach, you know, doing a, a movie. Nobody's thinking like, all right, I'm going to have three different versions of my next Star Wars movie. So it's an interesting way to do these things. I guess. I still haven't watched the uh, Justice League or the other one. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of content rolled into one release. And I think as we get more and more away from just going to movie theaters, I think he's kind of got the right idea, like create. More than just a movie, create a lot of experiences if you can. Why not? But then again, I think about what you said, you know, who's going to go watch the Rocky for, you know, Drago versus Rocky uh, director's video? Well, me, but who else would? Probably nobody. So, right. Maybe he's just wasting his time making things nobody's going to watch. 
All right, our last story. I'm going to let you talk about it. You sent it over. Oh, I was just uh, taken back by the headline. Me too. Me too. I'm surprised it's taken this long. At the same time, I'm surprised this show still exists. But uh, Homer won't strangle Bart any longer on The Simpsons. <laughs> After 34 years, The Simpsons is stepping away from senseless violence. Homer will no longer strangle Bart. Is that the only senseless violence they're getting away from? Is there no other slapstick humor? I sure hope they're keeping like itchy and scratchy and like just like the absurdity of what Warner Brothers cartoons used yeah. to be and just pointing it. I mean, that's very on the nose, you know? Stop! Stop! He's already dead. But during the season 35, oh, season 35, episode three, Homer reveals he's finally changed his ways when he and Marge visit their new neighbor. After introducing himself to the Springfield newcomer, the new neighbor comments on how firm his handshake is. See, Marge strangling the boy paid off, replies Homer. Just kidding, he adds. I don't do that anymore. Times have changed. Oh, man, did they? We can't watch that anymore. I like that. I just don't know. I don't know. Is that too watered down for you? Like part of the Simpsons lore, part of the Simpsons world, part of the Simpsons universe, I guess I'm trying to say had to do with that edginess and that pushing the limits and that not so serious aspect of it. Like taking a farcical look at the real world we live in. Like I, I don't, I know child, child abuse isn't funny. I'm not trying to say that, but why now after 35 years, you know what? Look how fucked up I am. I'm sitting here going, I don't see anything wrong with it. And then you just said child abuse. And I went, Oh, it is child abuse. I never even made that connection. Right. Because for me, it's a cartoon and not real life. And I just somehow exactly. enjoy things on the merit of what they are. I would hate to see somebody use the ex the excuse, no, no, it's okay. Or I thought it was okay. I saw it on The Simpsons. That's not going to hold up in court, you know? Well, it probably will. That's the problem. It probably will. It probably will. Didn't, like, somebody jump off a roof because Beavis and Butthead did it or something? And, like, <laughs> I think it got play. I think I remember that story. That could just be bullshit. I don't know, man. Lawyers are very, very cautious. Maybe you're right. Maybe it was a lawyer saying that. Hey, you got to stop that gag, guys. Maybe. Or maybe somebody wants to really make a change to, you know, the violence out there. But you better go start working on some of those murder porn movies that are coming out. I'm standing on my lawn wagging my finger at them. Well, I will leave you with this. And this is the final thought, and there's nothing in this article about it, but... Fox is now owned by Disney and Disney's kind of been gentrifying everything and neutering everything. So maybe this is Disney's hand on this. And I say this as a Disney fan, but it kind of goes in the flavor of everything else with the exception of the new Echo trailer. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why I was most shocked by it. So that's the last news story I got for you here, man. What are you going to do? I look at it sometimes and go, well, the world's changing. Somebody wants it this way and people want to change it back. It'll change back. Everything kind of sways. It's a pendulum. I'm pretty tolerant. Whatever you want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt other people, as long as it doesn't infringe on too many people, I won't squawk. Make a show that makes everybody happy. But that was one of my shows. You know, you don't need to change my show. I'm okay with what was there. You didn't need to change that one. Damn it. It hasn't been my show in probably about 15 years. But I will say this. You're never going to make a show that's going to make everybody happy. And even if you make the most gentrified show, somebody's still going to point their satellite dish right at your satellite feed and try to send up some kind of message like Captain. Yeah. Well, I'll see you, buddy. I got to get on this plane to San Diego tomorrow. I should be back in time to edit. If this show runs late, just like last time, something went wrong on my trip. Or maybe, Scott, you'll have to do the whole edit yourself and put it up there, and I'll have to talk you through it. But we'll get a show out. We'll get a show out. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Don't, 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 don't.